Hi, welcome to another episode of About the Authors TV. I'm your host, Jake Brown. If you're a fan of the long-running Peter Decker and Rena Lazarus series, then you'll want to join us tonight because we're here with the one and only Faye Kellerman, McCavity and Anthony Award winner and best-selling author of millions of books around the world. Faye, thanks so much for being on the show. I see a big, beautiful bookshelf in your writing room there behind you. What kind of books were you first grabbing off your parents' bookshelves back when you were a kid? Actually, most of the time I found my books in the school library. It's not that we didn't have books in the house. They were just of an adult type. Um, I have phonetics dyslexia. So I kind of grew up finding it hard to read. I had to learn how to read by looking at a word rather than sounding it out. I can sound it out, but I sound like the guy on Sesame Street. So it took me a while to learn how to read. But one thing good about phonetic dyslexia is once you know what the word looks like, you read. So my reading started around you know, seven or eight rather than the five or six level. Um, I always liked um, series. I read all the Laura Ingle Wilder series. I read all the Caddy Woodlawn things. I did all the Newberry books, all those kind of things uh, for kids. As I got older, I fell in love with Gothic novels. If you had a girl and you had a house and you had some spooky things in there, that was me. So I went through all of, um, you know, Jane Eyre, all of the Bronte sisters, um, Rebecca, anything that was spooky. As I grew older, um, I was introduced into the thrillers, Ross MacDonald, Raymond Chandler, the whole, the whole gambit of people. But I did not grow up like the typical English major. I was a math major. Yes, your path to the page was definitely an unusual one. Tell us a bit about how you found your way there. It was not writing, it was uh, games. I, I had a very wicked imagination as a kid. I was everything. Everything I read or everything I saw on television, I acted out in my own head. And I improvised. I added my own script. I added my own dialogue. I looked at this and I said, no, this isn't how it should be. This is how it should be. And I, used, I was a very strange child. I used to walk around in circles talking to myself. And people would say to my mom, is this child normal? They go, oh, she's just playing your games. Leave her alone. You know, I, it kept her out of her hair. And it must be hereditary because a, a couple of my children have been walking around talking to themselves. We, we live in our heads. All writers live in their heads, whether we get it down on paper or whether we just tell it to ourselves. We have this active, vivid imagination, and that's where mine came from. I never thought I could do anything with it. Never had any ambitions to be a writer, to be a screenwriter, to be a playwright, although my friends and I used to do what we call thinks which we had these big spiral notebooks and we'd pass them back and forth and, and you know, they got bigger and bigger and bigger. I think one of my friends still has them. Um, finally, I met the right guy. I mean, this was the confluence of circumstances that worked out extremely well. I met Jonathan Kellerman. And John, uh, unlike me, had been writing since he came out of the room. He came out of the room with him. And uh, he encouragement, he, it finally dawned on me that John was creating stories and putting down on paper. And I said, well, if I put down my imagination on paper, perhaps people will consider me a writer rather than, you know, one step above a schizophrenic. So that's exactly what I did. All forces in my head. Um, I never thought about doing anything with it. But all of a sudden, it became something that I could do to legitimize myself. At some point in this creative renaissance, you invented Peter Decker and Rena Lazarus, two of the most memorable characters and one that for the last 30 years and 30 books, fans have loved. Please tell us how they first each introduced themselves to you. As I said, I have a very big internal imagination and whatever I'm thinking about um, speaks to me. I, they did not come immediately. Uh, like most authors, you have many attempts that you um, tear up or that you show and that are just not good enough. It takes a while to evolve your voice. Uh, when you first start off, you sound like a million other people, but it's not an authentic voice. And that's just the nature of the beast. Very few people start off um, really kind of expressing themselves in the way that it eventually evolves to uh, express yourself. Um, Peter and Rena came out of my own experience because finally, 
it dawned on me to kind of write a little bit about what you know. And uh, I grew up traditional and we have a traditional Jewish Orthodox, modern Orthodox, however you want to call it, home here. And I loved reading mysteries that had a little bit of um, a hook character twist, something like that, rather than a straight mystery. Um, and because I was writing about a certain community, um, the PI didn't work for me. The PI didn't, just didn't work. I'm not gonna have an Orthodox Jewish woman sitting there going out solving murders like the Kimmelman series. That rabbi, if I were a member of his shul, I would quit. It's just too much energy that goes on there. So I knew Rena came first because Rena is more of an outgrowth of me. She is not me, but she is an outgrowth of me. And then I needed somebody else to counterbalance her. Uh, so Peter Decker was formed. He is the professional. Um, throughout the series, the hardest thing has been to involve both of them in various mysteries. Most of the time, Peter takes the lead, he's the professional, but um, sometimes Rena is an extremely active person. Sometimes she's more passive, but she's always there and she's very intuitive. She's much more intuitive than he is. He can figure things out, but she figures things out as well in more of an uh, intuitive manner. She's very good at reading people. That certainly comes across from the first book in the series. With Ritual Bath, how long did it take to create each character and their story on the page? I have to answer truthfully, it was a book I was writing, but I had no idea it was going to be the first book that I would publish. When you're writing a book, you're writing from the heart, but you're writing in a way that you're trying to attract somebody's attention. If I wanted to just sit in a room and write all by myself, what would be the point? You think that maybe you have something to say, not profound, but to entertain people. And that has been one of the highlights of this entire career when people say, um, either they've learned from my book or they found meaning in that book or they were in a cancer ward getting chemotherapy and my book took them away for two hours. That is the meaning of, of, of writing for me. But it's all about communication. So when you first start writing, when I first wrote The Ritual Bath, I had no idea that that was going to be the ritual bath that gets published and it's, you know, a uh, hundred reprints later. So what you try to do is you write characters that speak to you, characters from the heart, but characters that you think are going to attract somebody's attention. Like Rena was developed first as I said, and Decker was the counterpart to her. So I had this single woman because married woman would just never get involved in things like this. And I had this single man and I'm kind of a sucker for romance. And I said, okay, let's see where this relationship goes. And here we are like 35 books later and the relationship is still going strong. So that's how the ritual bath came apart. When it first was published, um, I think they published 1700, 1700, like enough for every bookstore for one copy in the country. And I think it sold 1200. It was not a rousing success. Uh, but they had faith in me and it had a better afterlife in paperback. And when it did hit paperback, it sold more. And little by little, we just built up the career. Uh, the follow-up books, Sacred and Profane, happened because, as you said, the characters were suddenly real to me because they were in a fully developed story. And once that was accepted for publications, I said, well, not done with these characters. I really didn't even have an idea that they'd be a series character. They evolve as you evolve. You evolve as they evolve. So once... They, uh, I enjoyed writing one book with them. I said, oh, what the heck, I'll try another book. And that's how Sacred and Profane was uh, born. Well, it's certainly a good thing for fans that you did. With Sacred and Profane, the second book in the series, you said it six months after the original. What made you make that decision? And generally, how do you time your books out? I don't know if it was that well thought out, but maybe subconsciously, that's what I had in mind. The characters have aged, but not exactly in real time. You know, some of them have been squished. Some of them have actually been aged in real time, 
uh, when we first started out, I'm always constantly recalculating. Well, if Cindy Decker is this old, how old would Decker be? Uh, how old would Rena's sons be? How old would uh, Gabe Whitman be? It's kind of a tricky process, um, but you want to keep them uh, current. And when you're writing a book, you want to keep it current. But it, we may shave off. It's 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 like a woman kind of shaving off a couple of years to, to show that they're a little younger. So that's kind of what we do. Now, when I write a book, I try to make it anywhere from nine months to a year from the previous book. So we have an idea that we're still in real time, but if it's not exactly, if it's a nine month year instead of a 12 month year, that's okay with me. With Day of Atonement and other early books in the series, we see Rena and Peter fall in love, but you also introduce us to their extended Brooklyn family. How much fun was that? Oh, past is always, uh, where we come from is always where very, very important, and her past was, was shocked me. Um, it's wonderful to get inside of Rena's head. Rena's a marvelously complex character. She doesn't say a lot, but when she does say things, uh, you should stand up and listen. And uh, that was really fun. Uh, like you said, um, Day of Atonement was really fun because all the characters were Jewish in there. Every single one was Jewish. So there were bad Jews, there were good Jews. I didn't have to think about who they were. It, it was of a piece, of a community, of a type, and uh, it was fun to explore every single kind of person in that uh, very restrictive community. So those kind of things, and I think Sanctuary too, when they went to Israel, that was also a lot, a lot of fun. Uh, anytime I can use my, um, my heritage, explain it a little bit more, explain where I'm coming from, I think not only do you understand the characters a little better, you understand the author too. In Prayers for the Dead, readers really take a deep dive inside Rena's Orthodox Jewish roots. It involved her, it involved her in love. It involved how she felt about her own religion as well as her outside feelings, how they balance the two, and of course, the character of Bram. My husband still hasn't forgiven me for the ending of what happened there. And it was just uh, twins, but not twins, uh, how, how this is dealt with. But her specific relationship with this guy from the past he was the link between her first husband, Isaac, over to Decker. So I, I felt I needed some sort of uh, honor paid to her past to bring her back into her present. She can't be just the person who was a mixed lady and then you throw her in and then she moves over. She had to have some very deep and complex emotions to get her to the point where she could accept a new relationship. And uh, this was kind, this book was not only uh, a delve into her past, it was more or less saying goodbye to her past. Uh, not, not in a permanent way, but at that point, I think up until that point, she wasn't quite ready to give it her all. But then when that happened, that was it. With cases like those solved in False Prophet, Sanctuary, and Justice, with Decker on the investigative side, how do you plot those out from book to book? I am a little different than a lot of mystery writers in so far, and thriller writers is, of course, you get things from uh, all your things around you. But I don't look for past cases to twist a little bit. I don't tend to look at FBI files to twist. I start with a theme. What do I want to explore um, for something like um, uh, Sanctuary? Um, it was how do Jews um, deal with divorce? What is, what is really a relationship falling apart? For something like Day of Atonement, it's uh, Peter's past. How, how is Peter going to accept his past when he actually meets his birth mother, uh, as we said, prayers for the death with Rena's past. So I start with an idea of what I want to explore, and then I take it from there. Um, 
very rarely do I take a story and, and make it my own. Um, they're almost always um, cut out of whole cloth, cloth, so to speak. Did the case in Milk and Honey, for instance, come to you in pieces? Milk and Honey uh, came up because at that particular time, Decker was working in a rural part of LA, which I wanted to explore. I didn't want the heavy city of LA. Um, that has been done. There's whole other areas of LA that are uh, much more uh, rural and much more undeveloped. So I really wanted to go into that area, into beekeeping, and to people who live there but don't live in the city. And that was my gem of uh, the, the germ of the idea with that. From there, what do I want to do? You know, lost kids are always. Um, a hook to get it in, they always immediately, not even for the reader, but for Decker, he's going to work harder when he sees a, a child than um, they work it hard no matter what. But kids, you can ask any professional, they always tug at the hard screen. And then you have this, this grisly series of murders. So both, uh, I start out with ideas, but I'm always surprising myself. I, it never goes the way that I kind of outline it. I used to be a much more furious outliner. Now what I do is I tend to think about it for a long, long time in my head. So I have a good start. And then as I get towards the ending, I sort of outline a chapter by chapter of how you want the ending to do. Because the ending is probably the hardest part in any thrillers books because you have all these balls up in the air and you have to bring them down slowly, one at a time. You don't want them all falling and crashing on your head. You want it to be like a juggler. You get one, and then you catch the other, and then you catch the other, and then that's it. So that's the part that I more or less think about and outline before. And now I find myself just, you know, starting with the ideas, and then one chapter leads to another chapter, and another chapter leads to another chapter. And then you get involved in like chapter 13 and 14 and a brilliant idea comes to you and then you have to work on the first 10 chapters to lead up to it. It was really always there. It just took a while for it to come out. Do you have two or three personal favorite endings you'd reveal for fans here? Shock endings or surprise. I loved the ending to Prayers for the Dead. I love Prayers for the Dead. It's one of my favorite books to write. Not only it gave Rena um, a voice from the past, it was just a, a great book, in my opinion, plot-wise. It was all about family. It's awesome. You know, uh, Graham's family, her family, you know, and, and Peter was there to solve the mystery, but the uh, history was just important. That's as important as the mystery. Uh, so that was a good one. Justice, I had I had that a Sanctuary Justice Prayers for the Dead. Those three books were probably... Um, I, I love every book I did, but those three books seem to speak to me very much. Justice especially spoke to people because they just loved the character of Cristinati. And um, Chris Wentman back then, and I, he kept on reappearing and reappearing. And every time he reappeared, people wanted more of him. So, you know, so he's a little bit in my current book, um, The Lost Boys. And I just finished the book following that called The Hunt. And he's very much in there. So um, I, I, I wanted to explore Gabe's parents way more than I've had an opportunity to do it. So this was my opportunity. Jupiter's Bones is one of my favorite. Do you try to push yourself into more dangerous places with more scary antagonists from book to book? Uh, thank you very much. What I realize in talking to you, but I, I, it's also uh, something that's in my head. I like to explore different communities and in, in, Prayers for the Dead, it was a Jewish community. Um, in Milk and Honey, it's a beekeeping community. Jupiter's Bones, it was a cult. And I wanted to give uh, uh, supporting characters um, March down more of a voice in that one. And she, she took a, a huge lead in that. Uh, all of them did. And I, I think cults are a very, very interesting thing. Uh, a lot of uh, people have said, uh, you know, the Hasidim are cults in and of itself. I don't believe that, but uh, you wanted to get inside something uh, that's uh, pre that the door is usually closed for. So that's that's one of the things I like to do uh, in um, 
first fruit of the dead. It was all about religion, other religions, Catholic religions, how Catholic relates, Jews, Jews relate, Catholic, all that kind of things. I all my books, I like to give the reader a window into a um, environment that they may not be privy to. In Grievous Sin, we first meet Peter's partner, Marge, and then we meet Decker's daughter and Stalker, and then we meet Gabe Whitman in Gun Games. Tell us a bit about how your supporting cast character creation process works. Supporting cast, uh, it, it can't just be one voice, otherwise why not write the first person. I write in third so I can bring in to all the supporting cast. Marge Dunn has been um, instrumental in all of the books, including the ones where I moved Peter to, Peter and Rena to, uh, the Eastern Seaboard. Marge has been there, Scott Oliver has been there, Pistanati has been there, Gabe Whitman has been there, and um, Decker's current partner, um, uh, Tyler McAdams, is a very important counterpoint to him. First of all, it gives the series a little bit of youth. It's a 35-year-old um, series, so I, I wanted a younger person there. And that allows me to put all sorts of generations into a story, which makes it way more interesting. And if it's only talking about my generations, that's not going to cut it. What you want is Decker's, uh, how Decker feels about new things and how a younger pupil feel about old things. And it also makes for a very, uh, a much richer uh, thriller because you can use all these devices. I mean, when I wrote The Ritual Bath, people were still using, you know, pay phones. You had to put a ten, 10 cents in. Now you have trackers, you have this, you have that. But the technology is much more interesting for writing and much more interesting plot. Having said that, of course, it's the characters. People don't remember the plots all that well. They'll go back and they'll remember, oh, uh, Milk and Honey, that's the one with the bees. Oh, Jupiter Bones, that's the one with the cult. But what they remember in the characters, they'll remember, you know, Graham, they'll remember, uh, you know, uh, Kristinati, they'll remember to get Whitman, they'll remember Marge. Um, that's what they, that's, that's who um, they speak to me about. With Armand Cranton and Stalker, or say the super scary killer in Stone Kiss, do those characters really take you to a darker place when you're writing them, where you get the chills, say? It, it's very scary, but stalking is a very, very scary thing. Um, it's, it's not hard. It is really not hard. What the hardest part about writing a bad character is not getting the headspace for evil. It's not make, it's, the hardest part is not making that character a cartoon. It's got to be fleshed, he's got to be fleshed out in some way or another, or else it's, you know, just the boogeyman. You don't want to write the boogeyman. You want to write a real person who has some real evil in him, that has some real psychopathology in them, but yet is still a person. So that's the hardest part. Not getting sympathy for him, but having the reader understand where this guy is coming from. Um, and that's with any person. Uh, when you write these kind of mysteries, good people turn out to be flawed and bad people turn out to occasionally have a redemp uh, redemptive quality. So that's, it's the mixing up that I find the most amusing. Cindy is, um, I wanted to give Cindy a major role. She has grown up with her father. They were divorced, of course. She lived with her mother, but her father had been such a major influence. And of course, she had to do exactly what her father didn't want her to do. Right? I mean, you know, that don't, policeman, this is not a good thing. This is horrible. Of course, she, she went right into it because it's kind of, not do as I say, do as I do, and she could see him that she he really loved what he did, and it was exciting. So she went into it, and she's just a great character on her own. She's confident. She's a wonderful, wonderful uh, person. You know, she she does what she wants to do. She wound up, you know, marrying who she wanted to marry, and in sweet in sweet dreams, you know, she found her husband. Not exactly the person that maybe her her, um, uh, her father had in mind, but it was the person she had in mind. So 
Yeah, because no, absolutely. She had to be her own person. She had well, to no. do her own thing. And she had to have a love affair with a person that would bug her father with. So that, that's just kids. Say with Captain Strap and Serpent's Tooth on the other end of the spectrum, writing a law enforcement character. Do you talk actually to real cops and other law enforcement officials to get a sense of how they really act, talk around each other, etc.? They're they're all wonderful characters. They just they just evolve. They do what they want to do. As I said, it's fleshing out characters. It's having dialogue repeating in your head over and over and over. Uh, I, we have this huge internal lives, all of us writers, but we also have these tape recorders in our life. Um, you have a scene, you play it in your head, and then you go, hmm, that doesn't quite sound right. You, you push the rewind button, you write the character in your head again, and then you go, nah, that Decker sounds too, uh, too unsure of himself. He wouldn't be unsure in this, in this thing. Rewind it again, go forward. All of the time that I have characters, like if, if Decker has conflict, a conflict with Strap, he doesn't have as much conflict with his current um, captain, uh, Mike Radar, as he did with Strap, but that's LAPD. You know, there, it's much more uh, regimented. Um, one of the reasons I moved him to the Eastern Seaboard was so he could do whatever he wanted. It was much, much looser structure. There's only so much you can do in LAPD without being too much of a, a rogue cop. And I, I didn't want to write a rogue cop. As so many millions of readers have gotten to know and love these characters over the years on the page, how well do you feel like you know them as creator? Yeah, I mean, I started in 1986, The Ritual Bath was published. So I've been, I, I've been around longer than I, I care to count my age. Um, a supporting characters are what really flesh out the book. It really makes the difference between having um, a puzzle where you just go from scene to scene to scene, kind of like a, a CSI or a um, you know a Law and Order where you go boom boom, then you go to that scene. That's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to write an entertaining thriller, but it had to be peopled with uh, characters that people love. And that's been one of the, the sustaining factors in my book. When are you going to bring X and X flags? What's happening with Rena's sons? What's happening with Cindy? Uh, did Hannah have her baby yet? You know, all these things. They have a huge family, uh, Decker and Rena, and with um, Gabe uh, Whitman as their uh, foster son. It, it just, there's, there's five of them and five spouses. And now there's children and everything. And that's probably reflective of Jonathan and, and um, uh, me because we started out, it was just the two of us. And then we had four children and now we have nine grandchildren. So when we get together, there's like 19 of us. And if we get together with his sister or his brother and extended family, it goes into the thirties and forties. So you pull in from all these different sources and all these different people um, are part of who you are and it makes you who you are and it gives you experience. And that's what uh, books are all about. It's a little slice of life that takes you away for two hours. From the commercial side, it must have been motivating when you have books like The Forgotten and Stone Kiss, which sold 260,000 copies, be as well received by readers as they were. What kept you excited when you were creating these new books on the page after so many years of doing it? Well, Stone Kiss specifically is revisiting Day of Atonement and revisiting justice because you have uh, Kristen on in it and you have um, her, her people, Jonathan, uh, uh, Decker's half-brother from the past that you were first introduced to in Day of Atonement. So they were all New York characters. And originally, Chris lived in New York, and he still does. And at that point, we were visiting New York a lot. And I said, let me do a New York novel. Um, same characters, different setting. And it was so much fun. Because every time you went to a, a different place, it would be different for Decker. So you could describe it through his newbie eyes, as you saw it through your newbie eyes, because I'm not intimately familiar with everything in New York. 
And that gave, I think, the book an extremely fresh uh, outlook, an extremely fresh feel. That's what I like to do. I like to take characters who everybody thinks they know and drop them into an environment that they have no idea where they are. And let's see how they get out of it. Let's see what they do. And that's how you keep kind of a series fresh. You can't, of course, characters evolve, but they have a, a set mind, they have a certain mindset. And unless you change them radically, which you don't want to do, um, you have to work within that mindset. So what can you do to keep the series fresh and change the environment? When we look at books like The Burnt House or Blind Man's Bluff, what kind of advice do you have for the aspiring author where plots involved? You know, I really, I really can't tell you how, how I, I got those ideas from, um, they, uh, they were just different characters that spoke to me. The characters um, who were involved in, in Blind Man's Bluff and who were involved in The Burnt House spoke to me first, and then I kind of wrote a story around them. I wanted to uh, explore this kind of character or that kind of character or, or a kind of a psychopathic character. Blind Man's Bluff had a real psychopathic character involved in him, and but not the same psychopath as maybe somebody like Chris Tanati. I knew I didn't want to bring him back. And, whether he escapes, whether he doesn't escape, all that kind of thing is, is very interesting to me. So you, you people, your characters, and you, while I don't have an exact storyboard, I do have four or five major um, characters that are going to be involved in this book specifically. The plot kind of revolves around them. How can I make them interesting? And what are they going to do? And how is their crimes going to interact in a way that uh, Decker going to um, put them together and, and solve the crime. It's, it's always a cat and mouse game between Decker and whoever he's working with, whether they're women, whether they're men, he has to put himself in the minds of these people. And in order for him to put himself in the minds of these people, I have to put myself in the minds of these people so I can give Decker some hints. With books like Murder 101, Theory of Death, Bone Box, and Walking Shadows, you really put yourself in the character's shoes. Is it a visual process when you're writing? When all those titles happened, when I, I moved Decker to the Eastern Zebroid in this small college town, my original thinking was, at Decker's original thinking, he's saying, I'm tired of LAPD. I'm tired of, the, uh, of how um, uh, rigid it is the constraints of it, the violence of the city, even though I'm in a, a, a partially rural area that doesn't get that much crime. It's just difficult for me. I'm moving to something, I, I, and, and my kids are on the other side of the country. I want to move. And Rena says, yeah, that's great. I want to move. And then Decker starts to think about it. He goes, well, I don't want to be bored. I don't want to be retired. Um, I, so he gets this job in this small college town. Now, in this case, Greenbury was uh, kind of modeled after the Claremont Colleges. When my daughter went to one of the Claremont Colleges, she went to, uh, uh, which did she go to? Uh, uh, Claremont McKenna, you know. Um, so I kind of modeled him after the five schools there. And I said, okay, we can do college towns. That would be interesting. That adds a youthful aspect, but nothing much really happens in college towns. So I said, what would happen if there was a specifically awful murder in the small town where they usually don't get murdered? Who's gonna lead the investigation? And of course you have somebody who's been in homicide for you know years and years and years. Of course he's gonna take the lead. So it's the difference, it's the town and gown kind of thing. They all start in a more rural area and then you have to go back into uh, the town to figure out, like I remember the theory of death, they found a body hiking. I always try to have it, and my latest book too, The Lost Boys, um, it starts out with um, a missing person. 
and they're always hiking through the hills and trying to find things. It's, it's this wonderful combination, which I've always loved, of urban grid and a rural nothingness. And it's scary. Wonderful to write. Uh, you, take a, you take a smaller environment with less going on, but that gives you more chance to expand because you do more microcosms than you do macrocosms. And you can really get a feel for these smaller towns and these diners and these students and going in and out of campuses. And now uh, with the Lost Boys, we deal with, with um, um, murders of the past. It's always the past coming up to haunt the present and uh, going into uh, campuses. All of this is done before COVID. I, I didn't include COVID. The, the last book that I just wrote called The Hunt takes place after COVID. I just didn't want to deal with this. I'm assuming A, that at some point life is going to go back to normal and that's how I then write. It's just too hard to do an investigation on Zoom. You've written Capital Crimes and Double Homicide in collaboration with your husband, Jonathan, and Prison with your daughter, Eliza. I imagine that was a lot of fun. Well, writing my daughter, writing with a 15 year old daughter is quite an experience. Um, <laughs> dealing with any adolescence is quite an experience. Um, she was very, very great to write with. When we originally had this kind of uh, things that we wanted to write a book together, we had this great idea. And I said, I will outline the book for you. I will give you um, chapter to chapter outlines and you come to me if you get in a, um, in a pickle, but you have to write it. I do not have time to actually sit down and write the bare bones of this. I can edit it, I can give you ideas. Uh, so she did all the writing and that part went really smooth. What I find, and the same with Jonathan, what I find working with people is it's never good to be in the same room with them. Some people, they love it. It works really well with them. Comedy, my husband said comedy, it really builds on each other's when there's other people telling jokes and, and situations in the other room. But with me, I'm kind of a one um, by myself person. So we manage, uh, John and I both have big egos, but we manage to uh, write together by a key, you know, checking in our egos at the door. That's the first thing. And we never saw each other. It was just passed back and forth uh, from um, computer to computer, from email to email, until we both felt we got something that we really, really, uh, that's a good combination between the two of us. And I'd edit him, and he'd edit me, and then I'd go back and edit him again, and until it was truly a combination. It was also very liberating, because uh, you, one of the thing about being a thriller writer or mystery writer is you're always boxing yourself into corners. You're always painting yourself out of corners. And at some point you have to paint that magical door that you can push in to get yourself out. Sometimes when I was writing those two novelettes with Jonathan, I, I was in a corner and I said, ah, let him figure it out. <laughs> Send it to him and say, you do, do with this what you will. And so that was kind of fun. Too. Speaking of creative freedom, standalones like the Quality of Mercy, Moon Music, and Killing Season must have been a welcome escape from the series world once in a while. First thing I uh, really enjoyed about them is putting them in different setting. Moon Music was in Las Vegas and adding that supernatural element. Uh, the Killing uh, Season was in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, so we explore all of the different heritages in that. And of course, the quality of mercy was, you know, during Shakespeare's time. So those were joyous for me. Uh, it was uh, fun to uh, scout locations. It was fun to work with different characters, too. I mean, Romulus Poe from Moon Music is a totally different person from Peter Decker. He's, uh, he's, he's a loner. He lives off the grid, you know. He, he marches to his own drum and he has this weird relationship with this girl, Allison, um, who is married to somebody else who he's working with. So all these weird things that once I established uh, Peter and Rena, I, I, I couldn't branch them out anymore. They were kind of in their own characters, so I could write that. Um, 
uh, the killing field was working with uh, adolescents on the verge. It was a coming of age book, but not my coming of age. And it was, it was completely, but what they all had in common was a murder was the catalyst that, that drove them all in uh, the killing season. It was the murder of his sister and this guy's relentless drive. It had totally dominated uh, Ben's uh, uh, adolescence. He couldn't progress until this murder was solved. And with Romulus Poe, he couldn't progress until this relationship was resolved. And a quality of mercy was just fun. I mean, it was also at adolescent, he was on the verge of adulthood in a time where women were subjugated and here she was a very, very strong woman breaking out. So even in killing a season, I was able to, in all three of those books, work with strong women. Uh, Roe in The Killing Season was a fantastic counter, a counterpart to Ben because she was super strong, stranger coming in and showing him a way and eventually getting sucked into the same thing he was getting sucked in. She couldn't progress until he progressed and he couldn't progress until he saw the murder. So they're very liberating because it, Whenever I write a standalone book, I'm always thinking, well, maybe I'll do this. And, but I always wind up staying in the genre of thrillers and mysteries because that's who I am. The Garden of Eden and Other Criminal Delights is one of my favorite titles in your whole catalog. What do you most enjoy about that part of creating one of your new books? I, don't, I think I, the Hieronymus Bosch, you know, the Garden of Eden and uh, everything, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, I, I don't know, they just kind of come to me. Sometimes uh, they're immediate, sometimes they're not so immediate, and I, I really don't like them, and I go through several uh, iterations of different titles, but uh, I try to, get a, uh, try to um, settle on a title that really encapsulates the book. So oh. this one uh, for my book coming out, The Lost Boys, talks about boys who are literally lost, but it's not only lost in a physical sense, it's lost in a mental sense. And uh, for this one, it's the hunt. And there's just, it, it's how people uh, progress from step A to step C. With the covers of all the Lazarus and Decker books, I've always wanted to ask you, there's a signature typewriter font that works through the titles of all of them. Was that your idea or something the publisher's art department came up with? The titles and the prints on the titles and everything, the art director comes up with that, but they wanted to brand it. Uh, so they had the same kind of uh, typing on one book versus another versus another. And then, uh, then you get to a different stage and you go, okay, we want to brand you in a different way. So I said, okay, and, you know, the paperbacks have changed too. The, the original uh, paperback of the ritual bath mm -hmm. is not the same paperback that they have now. What they wound up doing is branding, I think, first six books of the series in the same uh, title. So you'd know that if you picked up this book, this is going to be a Decorino book as opposed to a standalone book. But um, it, it's all part of creating a voice, which is, if I had to give any advice to future writers up there, I, I'd say, don't try to sound like anybody else try to sound like you and figure out the best you you can do because Raymond Chandler has been done. Ross McDonald has been done. You don't need to imitate him because the best is already there. And try to find what's in your, uh, your unique way of communicating because that's what writing is about. It's about communicating. And if you don't have a unique way of communicating, um, Everybody has, I'll take that back, everybody has, uh, when you talk to a person, your unique style. Try to work with, with that. I imagine writing dialogue back and forth between Peter and Rena has got to be second nature by now after so many years of hearing them talking in your head. Dialogue has been probably the easiest thing because for, since I was a little girl, I've always had people talking to me. And like I said, with that tape recorder, sometimes Peter will talk to me and it really doesn't sound like, and I'll, I'll write it down. 
or I'll think I'll write down a piece of, I'll type down a piece of dialogue and then Peter goes, no, I would never say that. that that's not me. And Rita would say, no, we don't talk to each other that way. What are the things you do when you edit? Editing is like a very, 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 very important process. And I don't mean the, the editing that your editor gives you, which is important and you should listen to editing and you should at least consider what people are, or what your editor is telling you. But when you self-edit, the, it, I, you have people talk and they cuss a lot. And then you go back and take out like 95% of the cuss words because you should be able to describe an emotion without using a full letter word. Sometimes you have to leave it in, but most of the time, just get it the heck out there. And that uh, pe people tend to ramble a little bit long, make it succinct, make it the first sentence should want to go to the second, the second sentence should want to go to the third, and, and so on and so forth. Don't prolong it. If, if you're prolonging it, it it's, it's going to be boring to you and it's going to be boring to your reader. If you write a scene and it's exciting to you, it's going to be exciting to your reader. So you're your first good editor and you should make sure that whatever you write is something that uh, affects you emotionally. Congratulations on all your success. It's certainly reflected in the bookcase behind you. Is this actually where you sit and create every day, the Peter and Rena series? Yeah, I, I had a lot of kids while I was writing. It's easier now. It's easier now. But um, it wasn't hard then either. It was, my, uh, it was my time for myself and my head. So that was great. I have my own office. I have my own headspace. But now things are quieter. And I, I have to admit, it's a lot easier. I feel uh, it works for me to have my own office. It works for me to have my office, close my door, say thank you very much, and uh, shut out the um, well, having said that, I can write anywhere. Do you like to have music on while you work? Nope. Silence. I don't want background. I don't want this. I don't want any distractions. Furthermore, um, we have a beach house. Sometimes we go to the beach house and they go, oh, how do you work with this beautiful ocean staring at you? And I go, you know, you're in your head. You're not looking out there. You're totally in your head. So I have worked in closets. And I have worked in expansive offices. I, I like my office because I know where everything is, but I can work anywhere. In closing, what's most fun about new ideas that hit you day in and out that you know you're going to use in a new book? Uh, I'm always inspired, inspired by the book I'm writing currently. That's where the inspiration happens. But the ideas happen before I even sit down in the bathtub, taking a walk around the garden, whatever it is. Um, now it's just probably taking a walk around the garden because I can't go too many places. But, you know, life inspires me. Faye, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much again for taking out time to be on About the Authors TV.